Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here today. And uh, uh, I have been teaching in this uh, very LT for the last uh, uh, 10 years, and uh, today is probably the first time I saw so many people in the uh, seat, and uh, <laughs> do make me a little bit nervous. Uh, but I think it's a really good uh, opportunity as here to um, uh, borrow the sounder of Vitalik so that we can promote some of the research we're doing here in NTU. Um, today I'm going to talk about more on this uh, security aspect of uh, Web3. So I'm currently wear two hats. Uh, one is I'm the faculty member of School of Computer Science and Engineering in, the, in NTU. Uh, another hat is I'm the co-founder of uh, MetaTrust Labs, uh, which is a spin-off from the university uh, focusing on the Web3 uh, uh, security. So hopefully I'm, I will not do too much commercial today in the talk, uh, and all, at least half-half. Right? Uh, so this is the, uh, sorry, this is the right slide, is this the right slide, uh, is this the right slide, uh, this may not, maybe I can use my laptop, yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I think the, the computer is also got nervous. So, <laughs> um, I need to. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. Okay, all right. I think we are all set. So, this is some number I want to show to everyone. Uh, this has been the amount of money stolen in the Web3 to the August uh, this year. Uh, I don't think this number is very accurate because uh, there are a lot of uh, hacking events or the accidents are actually not uh, fully reviewed. Uh, I think this is actually a very conservative number. Uh, and uh, this is also bring the question, right, since uh, in the um, uh, blockchain or the Web3 era, uh, everything is the assets, which means a lot of money and the security is super important, but why this thing is still happening? Probably you can see from the newspaper, from different kind of channels, the hacking event is not, if not happening every day, at least one week, you can see some news, right? But now the question is that since the, uh, uh, the blockchain security is so important, uh, what is the reason why don't we make it secure? Um, maybe this is some of the potential answer to this question. Uh, in the last couple uh, months, we are trying to summarize all the possible attack surfaces of smart contracts. Uh, and you can see this is a huge map. Starting from the uh, layer one, the public chain, and now we have the cross chain, now the layer two, we have the optimism, ZK, all these things. All these foundations, they have the, um, the vulnerabilities and problem. But on top of this smart, uh, the, the, the layer one, layer two, you have the smart contract, and then you have the layer three, the application, DeFi, GameFi, NFT, and so on, right? And each of these layer have their own problems, right? If, if imagine you are a developer and you are writing some uh, Web3 blockchain applications, uh, even I ask you to remember all the uh, vulnerability names, it is a tall order, right? Rather, you think you can try, when you write the code, you can avoid everything. And the furthermore, beyond this existing code you're writing, actually there are other more challenging problems. For example, we have the software supply chain issues, which means when you're writing soft software nowadays, you are not building everything from scratch. Very likely, 99% of the time, when you, whatever application you're writing, 60% uh, to 90% of the code are actually borrowed from the open source ecosystem. And this is also very true for smart contract. We just did a very interesting study, did an analysis. We found 80% of the smart contract, are the code in the smart contract actually from the open source. 
which means even you have done all this, your job, you invite some security auditing company to do the sort of auditing, but the, all the third-party code, this 80% of third-party code, may not be fully checked and audited. And this brings another problem. And some of our research paper published in the last couple of years found that this kind of uh, open source related uh, brings vulnerability not only happening in the layer one, layer two, but also happening in the smart contract itself. So imagine with all of these challenges, how, you ca how can you secure your application? I think this is the things we, are, we want to address. And this is exactly the gap uh, between the security auditing team and the, security, the software development team. Because now the software developer want to go for this agile development. They want to release their software every week, uh, every two weeks. But you cannot, or you are not able to afford security auditing uh, tasks uh, every two weeks, right? So there is a huge gap between the security auditing team and the de development team. So the goal for us, the, all the research we're really working on is how to bridge the gap to bring more automated solutions and bring more intelligence, right? So this is, I think, the key things we want to highlight today here. Um, and then in this industry, there are already very mature solutions product called the, uh, the DevSecOps solution or DevSecOps two chains, the SAST to find the vulnerability in your own code. SA is finding the open source component in your software and review the end day vulnerabilities. And there are the IST, DST to a different way to find vulnerability. So these are the very mature tools. So I will not dive into this, but uh, rather want to, uh, this is the commercial slide, right? We want to, uh, the, this is the things MetaTrust is trying to do. Essentially, we are doing a DevSecOps to provide the automatic vulnerability detection tools, not only in the development process, but also in the operation process, so that you don't really need to worry about the security. Because you cannot just rely on the auditing. When you put the chain online, you, the, the token online, you also need to monitor the security transaction. So the things we are doing is trying to starting from the software design and to the development testing, all the way to the operations. So we provide the full-fledged automated solutions and give you the full 24/7 uh, uh, sub, uh, security support. Right. So this is the things we are doing here. Uh, one small thing I want to highlight here is for the design verification. Uh, I remember just now there is a question asked about the ZK kind of security, which is, seems a little bit more challenging. Not many the kind of uh, security audit team can easily audit in their kind of circuit. So actually we have been working on the formal verification for the last 15 years and we have recently just launched a very, um, I think, powerful verification platform uh, for the first time and uh, we are able to do verify very complicated system and we just verify the uh, uh, Uniswap version 3 uh, in a complete manner, right? So this is the kind of things we are doing on the research side, but we hope also to make this available for this kind of critical infrastructures for Web3. Uh, now back to the business. So we're, uh, the title of this talk is talk about security copilot, right? We are talking about the, how the AI or AIGC can potentially help the security, especially on the Web3 security. So this is really the focus. So this is what the early work we published in the 2019 uh, when uh, we're trying to first thinking about how we can use, uh, how can we use AI to find vulnerabilities. And the idea is actually very simple, right? Think about how you can use, apply AI in any domains. It's the simple idea is I have some training data, I train an AI model, and then I can use the model to do the prediction, to have a certain kind of intelligence. So this is exactly the same idea. But here, what we are doing is slightly differently is that uh, when we talk about the AI, the, all the research uh, started or rooted from the NLP space. People treat everything as text. So this work actually is a very interesting attempt. We try to treat the code in a different way. We think code software have its own structures and syntax and semantics. So if you want to learn something from the software, you should not treat the software as texts. We should use the structured information in the software itself so that the deep learning or the machine learning master can learn a more accurate behavior of the software. So this is essentially the things we did in 20, uh, 2019. The paper is published in a very good place, but uh, the, side the sad result is that when we are re really trying to deploy this uh, in, the real, uh, in the real application, we found that it's not a good result. The main reason for this is that the data set for the vulnerability typically is small. 
We cannot have millions or tens of millions like ImageNet, this kind of huge database. We have maximally uh, 200,000 uh, uh, vulnerability database, and that is actually considered as a small data set. The second thing is you have many unseen vulnerable code before. For this kind of unseen code, you, when you have a small data set, it's very difficult to achieve good result. Right? So this was the kind of the, the, the challenge we faced. But this year, uh, the ChatGDP uh, go viral, right? Everybody is talking about ChatGDP, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, when it launched, there are a lot of interesting articles talking about, okay, how you can potentially leverage ChatGDP. You send your smart contract to the ChatGDP, and the ChatGDP will tell you, okay, it has vulnerability or not, right? So this was some kind of very interesting news uh, during that time. But when we saw this, we think, okay, this sounds very, very interesting but whether the chat DTP itself can really address the problem. So that was the question. Interestingly, two weeks later, after the news released about using chat DTP to do the audit, uh, all the auditing firm start to panic. They start to publish the article to say, hey, chat DTP is not going to work. Why? Because chat DTP is a probability-based model. It cannot recognize the subtle difference in the code. I can easily change one character in a piece of code to turn a vulnerable function into a non-vulnerable function. But I don't think ChatGDP is able to, have that, uh, able to distinguish such, such kind of subtle difference in the one character change. So they have uh, showed many cases, you have, there are false positive, false negative by ChatGDP in terms of vulnerability detection. So when we saw these two news, we are really thinking, okay, so what is really the right way or whether we have the potential uh, application of the AIGC in vulnerability detection for smart contract? So this was the, really the question bothering us. And after a while, we figured out, okay, so same that directly using ChatGPT may not be a good thing, but maybe we can go from a slightly different angle. We were thinking, okay, what is the good things ChatGPT about? There are a number of capabilities. Uh, in it, one of them is that it can understand and comprehend the code. So this is the part we start to uh, think, okay, maybe we should not use ChatGPT to tell us whether it has vulnerability or not, but whether we could ask ChatGPT to say, can you help me to understand what this smart, is, a smart contract is doing about? What are the important and security-related operators variables that I need to pay attention. And this is, you think about, this is essentially the security expert or the security auditor, what they are doing when they are doing the security auditing, right? They are trying to figure out the important variables to say, hey, this is DeFi, their interesting variable are doing the transactions, maybe potentially can be manipulated by the attacker through an input parameter. So these are the things we try to ask ChatGPT to do. Once we identify the important piece, then we say, okay, please tell me how to exercise, formally, uh, rigorously exercise using all this program analysis, formal method to find all the possible execution paths and see which paths can really lead you to vulnerability. So this is actually, we are trying to use ChatGDP as a kind of method to, this is the, this is the research paper we just uh, uh, submitted. Uh, uh, this is the process, right? We are combining the capability of ChatGDP with the program analysis capability so that we can try to simulate how the auditor really understand the, 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 uh, how to detect the vulnerabilities. And the result is pretty encouraging because the, uh, after we've done uh, quite some of intensive experiments, uh, the false positive rate and the false negative rate is uh, uh, below 20%, which is a much better result than any uh, security scanning tools out there, right? So this is the things where we have. Um, and uh, uh, so this is to, uh, sorry, this is to find the, the, the vulnerabilities using static uh, uh, program analysis. And another thing we're trying to do here is to uh, leverage a different method. Uh, when we run the code, how can we find vulnerabilities within the smart contract? So in this regard, uh, the problem or the challenge is not to run the smart contract, but rather the challenge is to really how to write a driver to test the smart contract. Because Google has a very famous project called the, open, uh, the OSS Fast. The F OSS Fast is a very important project to try to find the vulnerabilities in the open source libraries. 
So they have this platform. Everyone can contribute to this platform in terms of finding drivers to drive to fast uh, uh, open source library. But uh, uh, and they can find vulnerabilities. But the challenge is really. Uh, the bottleneck is really the number of uh, drivers contributed by the ecosystem. So given this, we are thinking, okay, how can we use the AIGC or the ChatGPT to help here? And uh, the idea is that here we are trying to explore a different capability. In the first work, we are trying to leverage the, code, the, uh, the capability of code comprehension in the chat GDP. But in this one, we are trying to leverage the capability of code generation of chat GDP. And the idea is that when I give you a library I want to fast, or a smart contract I want to fast, I ask the chat GDP to understand, okay, what is the behavior? What is the documentation of the uh, smart contract? And then ask the chat GDP to write the test driver based on the interface, based on the documentation. And in this way, we can simplify the filing process and make it more in a more automatic way. Right. So that is why currently we are building a, a more, we call it on-chain filing. Uh, we are using ChatGPT to generate driver, but at the same time we are using many interesting on-chain data to make the filing more effective. Right. So this is the second idea how to use the uh, ChatGDP in the uh, security analysis. Um, and this is uh, some interesting results. Uh, we found that 4.0 is much better than ChatGPT 3.5. Uh, another very interesting observation we found is that uh, uh, in Singapore, during the daytime, the same engine has better results than the, uh, 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 the, the, the result we got in the evening time. We were puzzled a little bit, but later we found out, okay, because the, during the nighttime, that is a heavy usage of chat GDP in US, and then the accuracy drops. So this is the, the kind of interesting experiment we got. Uh, but this is just the starting work. We found that still many uh, problem we need to address, like very complicated APIs. When you have concurrencies in the APIs, to make the API sequence correct is not an easy thing, right? So these are the second uh, adoption of the AIGC in the vulnerability fighting. The third one we are doing here is on the pen testing. We treat the system in a, as a more uh, kind of black box way. We are leveraging this auto GTP idea uh, to uh, uh, decompose the security analysis or pen testing task into a number of smaller tasks. And then we can ask ChatGDP to help us to do the reasoning, how to split the task, and then to do the generation of the pen testing task. And after you have the, execute the pen testing task, you have the result. Then we do our passing to understand what is happening after you do this pen, uh, 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 pen testing task. And then you keep iterating that. And in this way, we can really automate this pen testing uh, solutions, which can, would consider to be very difficult to be automated. Right. So this is another kind of capability we are leveraging the chat GDP as a common sense to understand the uh, application and understand the result of the pen testing task. So this three uh, example shows you actually directly using the chat GDP actually already can help us in quite a bit in terms of vulnerability detection. And after that, we want to do something even further because when you find vulnerability, the the end result is not just seeing the report, the auditing report, right? The final goal you want to achieve is that once you know that you have some vulnerability in your smart contract, you want to, do, you want to know how to fix it. So actually, there are many other steps, like the, after detecting vulnerability, you have to do vulnerability diagnosis and the vulnerability repair. So this all require the very deep uh, uh, security uh, expertise if you want to do it. So here we are thinking, okay, how can we even you the ChatGDP to further automate all the steps in the vulnerability uh, life cycle. And uh, these are some of the work we have done, just very recent work. Uh, one is to explain what this, this vulnerability is about and also locate the root cause of the vulnerability using the AIGC. And here, these are some interesting results. Uh, the colored text shows you these are really the correct explanation of this vulnerability function here. And uh, the result is much better than the previous uh, uh, neural network based solution. And here we are using not just using the capability of ChatGPT, but we go one step further. What we are doing here is to do a little bit of fine tuning. We try to collect 
the right information about vulnerability explanation and the vulnerability uh, 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 localization and put that information on top of the large language model to perform the so called fine tuning so that we can get a better result. Another thing here we are doing is to do the repair. So, to do the repair, not only we are doing a little bit of fine tuning, uh, we are also doing kind of reinforced learning to teach the large language model what is the correct way to fix the vulnerability. And here, the data we're using is that we collect the vulnerable function and its corresponding patch function. So we teach the large language model what is vulnerability and what are the corresponding fix for this vulnerability. And once the large language model learns this, then they can apply it in other examples. And the, the result is actually very, very encouraging. If you look at here, we are looking at the Java and the C vulnerability fixing. Our tool can fix 25 vulnerability in the C programming language. We can fix 20 of them, which is almost more or less similar to a junior security expert. And when we see the result, we got actually very excited because this is really the time you can see, actually, when we talk about the AIGC, it indeed can bring further knowledge uh, into this security analysis. And I think this is just some of the initial work, and uh, this is just the beginning. I think there are a lot of further opportunities we can go with this. Uh, so with all of this, we are actually come up with some kind of um, uh, uh, platform we call the Metascore, and the idea is using all these scanning tools we developed to come up with a more uh, accurate, more um, uh, quantitative indicator of each tokens uh, in the Web3 uh, Web ecosystem to see, okay, what is the security capabilities of these, these tokens? And in terms of the security developments, security investment, security transaction, IP risk, and code quality. So, and all of these are actually measured by our tools. We are not just collecting data from the internet, but rather most of these numbers are measured by our tools. So this is the, the slides I'm talking about, the security copilot. How can we achieve the security copilot? It's actually uh, not something very straightforward. So I mentioned there are some tools like this security analysis tools we're building, but to make it as a security copilot, you cannot just give the developer the tools. What we want here is actually we build a large language model on the top and put all these security capabilities as plug-in for this large language model. And then the security copilot, what he, this uh, copilot is doing is that you really sit there as an agent or your peer uh, programming partners with the developer. Whenever they write something, the copilot will tell you, oh, hey, you are using a outdated open source library. You should replace it. When you write something, the copilot will tell you, hey, this function, potentially, you are calling an unsecured API. You should stop it. So this is the things we want to build really as an assistant for the developer to have this kind of seamless security development assess, uh, assistant. So this is the overall idea. But to do it, another uh, challenging part is that we don't just want to use the ChatGPT to enable our security tools. Rather, we want to build our own large language model to support this. And that leads to some of the really exciting ongoing work we are, we are seeing how can we build a better vertical uh, 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 large language model to understand the software and understand the vulnerability. So this is the things we are working on now. Uh, and this is uh, one of the big projects we're doing here, or sorry, the, uh, uh, called Tyson. So this is a government funded this kind of uh, security center in NTU, focusing on two parts. One is using AI to solve security applications. Second part is to address the security, uh, the AI itself, the security. So what I talked today mostly is on the top part, right, to, find, to apply AI on security. But actually we have some very interesting work uh, uh, recently to hack the large language model. We find a way to do prompt injection. It's kind of a new malware for large language model so that we can still useful information from the large language model. So this is this part, the security of the, large, the, the AI model. And things that can go further is that not only we can steal information of the large language model, we can actually ask the large language model to do bad things. For example, we can instruct the large language model to do mining for cryptos, which is, should not be uh, allowed. Right? So these are the very recent kind of research we are doing here. 
um, I think this is the very, very important if you want to have a better security in this kind of Web3 ecosystem. Um, and uh, this is probably the last slide I want to uh, highlight. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, the, uh, the Web3, uh, when we talk about all the security, uh, people think, okay, you're, you guys just uh, uh, are security kind of um, uh, geeks, but uh, how you can be interacted with this Web3 ecosystem? What are the possible kind of uh, applications or adaptations for this uh, 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 open source uh, and AI and Web3? So here we are thinking about some, very, something very interesting. Uh, we are trying to do a digitization of the open source ecosystem. Why we want to do that? Because you think about this, software nowadays is purely developed by a number of developers in a very much decentralized manner, right? There is a project, I'm not sure you heard about this, called the Gitcoin. We're trying to uh, support different kind of open source projects. But now the question is that, which are the important open source projects worth supporting, worth donation? Nobody knows, because we don't have a clear global picture about open source ecosystem. So here, what we are doing is that we are trying to build a open source map to show you what are the interesting things there, what are the important libraries. Like for example, I have a very important library in Open Zeppelin, which are almost used by all the uh, smart contracts. I should definitely put a lot of money to do the auditing for that. Otherwise, if one vulnerability basically leads to the complete corruption of the uh, blockchain ecosystem. Right, so this kind of digitization is very, very important. So we want to use that as a foundation to understand the whole ecosystem. But how to operate this? A Gitcoin has a very good idea to do the donation, but how to have a better um, protocol, a better decentralized way to encourage and influence the open source ecosystem to do this kind of security thing in a better way? So could we come up with some uh, the open source DAO to do it? So this is something I'm really uh, 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 th uh, uh, thinking now. And how can we really link this with Web3? Another interesting thing is that uh, this open source is very much linked with uh, AIGC. One of the reasons is that all the AIGC model now can generate the code. But where is the code coming from? This goes back to the same question. All the large, large language model, their code are trained from the open source ecosystem. So you also need a high quality, secure, compliance the code for the large language model. So now all of these three things become highly coupled. You need to have a way to find a good high quality code and then you use it for the AI to train it and then you need to use Web3 to further to do the governance of the open source ecosystem. So this is, our, I think, the, the entry things of the, 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 the system. And uh, this is my, really the last slide. So now we are coming up with something very cool. I, I name it Software G Genome Project. Essentially, we want to build a kind of a, a genomics database for the software, like the human beings, and to really understand what is happening uh, in the digital world. I think this could be the very important foundation for the future. But how to make it? I think Web3 could play a major role here because this must be a decentralized mechanism or the organization if we want to make it really impactful for the human beings. Okay, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for the inspiring speech from Professor Liu. We still have five minutes for a few questions from the audience. Okay, um, this one? Yeah. So, uh, as we know, there's an agent's model for, as we know, there's an agent's model for GBT large language model. So, uh, for example, compare to train yourself, fine tune yourself to become a security co-pilot or uh, become an agent of the large language model, maybe ChatGPT, Llama 2. So how do, do you decide and why do you decide? And uh, because as we know, we are doing lots of things like agents and the agents just require reinforcement learning instead of uh, huge amounts of training data. But that's also a huge amount of data. So compared to the cost effectiveness and the decision, why would you choose the co-pilot model or uh, how would be the decision process would be? Yeah. 
uh, I think this is a very big question. <laughs> Um, now, if you're looking at this logic model and all the different applications, there are many different ways uh, we have seen, at least the three different ways you can uh, use the logic model. First, directly from, uh, from the prompt. Second, if you want to go deeper, right, you can do the kind of a bit kind of uh, fine tuning, find your own domain data and uh, do a little bit of fine tuning. And then the third one, you can actually even go further. What you can do is you can do the pre training you can have your low-level data and then to teach like learning model with this foundation. So to do this thing all correctly, which require a deep understanding about this domain. So this is the first thing. Once you have this, when, how you can combine this and then interact with users through an agent model, that is another uh, problem you need to address. And for, to do it, you need to really understand, okay, when you have a similar kind of uh, large language model, how to evaluate, compare, and how to let them to co collaborate. So that is the second kind of the challenge you need to address. Uh, I cannot say we have all the answers today, but actually this is require a many interesting research to be done in this direction. But I think this should be the next generation of the software uh, interaction because the uh, LUI um, is, I think, probably a much easier way to uh, interact with human beings. But how to make it really useful, how to derive your kind of security capabilities, uh, the plugins, foundation model, and link them all together with a uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, front end LUI, I think this still requires a lot of interesting research. Thank you. Okay, time is up. Um, now it's our next speaker. So, you know, thank you for Professor yeah, Bill's excellent speech and Q&A. <laughs>